I uh, have long believed the bulletin of atomic scientists plays a critical role in this country in addressing uh, what security means. And this couldn't be a more propitious, pivotal time, it seems to me. You know, you may have seen the other day in the New York Times that in the last year, more people have perished from COVID, Americans, than during World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War. And if it, there's ever a time to rethink what security means, uh, it's now. And I think um, I want to, Elizabeth Eves deeply reported, important, um, really thought provoking uh, article is at this time even more important. So thank you. And um, um, I, I, I want to um, introduce Elizabeth and Thomas Countryman and then open a moderated conversation for about 30 minutes and take your okay, questions. You on... um, Thomas Countryman is chairman of the board of the Arms Control Association, a nonpartisan NGO, which analyzes key security issues and advises the executive branch, Congress, and the public on choices to promote global security and reduce the risk, risk that weapons of mass destruction, like the one Elizabeth writes about, which may cost this country $100 billion, uh, that the danger that they will be used. Retired from the Senior Foreign Service in January 2017 after 35 years of service. And at that time, he served simultaneously as Acting Undersecretary for Arms Control and as Assistant Secretary for International Security and Nonproliferation. We need that now, nonproliferation. Elizabeth. Elizabeth Eves is a contributing editor for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist. Before joining the Bulletin in 2013, she worked in writing and editing roles at Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and Reuters. She's freelanced widely, including for Foreign Policy, Harper's, The New York Times, Slate, The Washington Post, and Wired, and holds a master's degree from uh, the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia. In 2020, uh, the Bulletin published her investigative story, Hot Zone in the Heartland. And I understand you also published a really intriguing kind of port portraiture of the day after the film, which uh, really moved things in 1983 on the nuclear dial. So Elizabeth, let us begin um, with, with you. I mean, as I said, I've heard from so many people about the importance of your article in laying out historic economic cultural, political, frame, the framework for understanding why at this time, this country would be, quote, modernizing and building a $100 billion weapon of mass destruction. Um, tell us a little bit about what led the bulletin to assign this piece now, and what do you and the bulletin hope will be its impact? Sure, uh, thanks Katrina, and thanks everyone for coming. So um, the bulletin's uh, editor-in-chief, John Mecklin, uh, and I knew that we wanted to do something on nuclear modernization, which is actually an even bigger story than this one weapon. Um, modernization as a whole is actually probably gonna cost $1.7 trillion um, and involves a lot of different weapon systems. But we were trying to think of a way of how we could actually narrow that down and you know, make it more engaging because um, my sense was, you know, a lot of defense stories can feel like a lot of machines and numbers. Um, and I, so I was trying to think of a way to focus it more, get people more involved with it. So decided to focus on one specific weapon um, and the people and the money around it. Um, now, we could have chosen a few different things. You know, there'll be new, the US will have new, um, uh, you know, nuclear bomb carrying submarines, um, uh, long range standoff missile, uh, tactical nukes, like any one of those is actually, you could actually get into a, a sort of strategic debate about, like they're sort of controversial enough for that. Um, but ended up deciding to focus on the, uh, the GBSD as it is known, ground-based strategic deterrent, um, because uh, it is, uh, it's a, it's a land-based nuclear missile. It is exceptionally expensive, although not actually the most expensive modernization project, but it is extremely expensive with a $100 billion price tag just to build it. Um, and also one of the most uh, strategically dubious, um, which we'll, we'll get into more today, but you know, there, there's really a lot of 
questions about like, if you're gonna have nuclear weapons, is this even a smart one to have? Um, and then it's the replacement for the Minuteman three, um, which is, you know, a missile with some historical resonance um, that's really embedded in these, in these five states, in the communities of these five states. So it seemed like a good weapon to focus on and tell the story of um, to, to draw people into this subject. What I found so powerful in the article was how you report in these communities in, North, in Wyoming, Montana, and North Dakota, but how these jobs around the GB, ground-based deterrent system, have become a lifeline have become a jobs program, a safety net for these communities, even an infrastructure program, and how little these programs have to do with security. Uh, you quote someone many people on the call may remember, Bruce Blair, who was an important figure in the nuclear arms control community, who was a missileer who actually underground felt the threat of it. And he said, today, nuclear weapons are the food on the table in too many cases. Tell us what you saw, because I think that is part of the history of the defense weapons system, nuclear system in this country and how we can move forward. Yeah. Yeah, when you go into these communities, the missiles are, they're literally around you. I mean, you can drive up to them. They're along the side of the freeway um, in their silos. Um, and you see that play out economically too. So consider, so Malmstrom Air, so there's three, um, three missile bases. One of them is Malmstrom Air Force Base, which is in Great Falls, Montana, so central Montana. And it's um, the biggest employer in the city. It's one of the biggest employers in that part of the state. Um, it has a, a really big economic impact. And I, you know, I met with people at the Chamber of Commerce there who were literally excited, you know, like use that word to have all the new um, construction and upgrade um, that's going to come along with putting the, you know, taking out the old missile and putting the new missile in because you'll have to upgrade roads and electrical um, functions and things like that. Um, and even down to something like um, the missiles are very scattered. So when the missileers who operate them go to their post, um, which is an underground, um, kind of an underground pod below a thing that looks kind of like a ranch house. They're going through these small towns and they'll stop in these small towns and they'll go to the corner store or go to the restaurant and get takeout. So it's a very literal and direct kind of economic impact. I mean, one gal who grew up in, um, in, in Choteau, I think I'm pronouncing that right, a town in Montana that has missiles around it. She said, you know, it's in everyday life, it's roads, it's good, it's good roads, better roads than we would have otherwise. Um, so it's, uh, it's become a, an economic lifeline. Um, and I think that contributes to um, the challenge of like, trying to pivot and make a different decision and, and maybe not have this kind of weapon anymore. Yeah, in a country where we have more weapon missiles, I think, than hospitals. Um, but I wanted to ask Tom, if I could, um, you, we had a chance to speak before doing this session. And you talked about how they're actually active military lobbying for what you and not the peace movement consider dysfunctional weapon systems in the 21st century, unable to meet the challenges of this time. Do you foresee that that kind of lobbying, which is not new, and I Bill Hartung's on the call, he writes about this all the time, that nexus of lobbying, military uh, officers, will that derail any progress that a Biden administration might want to make as they pursue a nuclear posture review in their first year? Well, thanks. That's a, a topic that we could spend a, an hour on all by itself. There is right now a campaign, not necessarily a coordinated campaign. It doesn't have to be centrally coordinated to be an echo chamber uh, in which uh, those who will benefit from this massive contract, as well as the representatives of those five important states, as well as members of the military, are already talking about the ground-based strategic deterrent, the GBSD, being absolutely indispensable for American security. 
this is not unprecedented, this kind of campaign. I think it is unseemly when active government officials, military or civilian, join in the public campaign. Uh, but ultimately, what we have to remember is that these are policy issues for the president to decide. He guides the decisions, not the bulletin or the Arms Control Association, and not the professional military alone. So it's now up to Joe Biden to define his priorities for the nuclear arsenal for not just the next four years, but for the longer term, the posture, the arsenal, the policy that the United States ought to have. And part of Elizabeth's fantastic article is to ask some of the hard questions that have to be not summarily answered and rejected by military analysts or by industry advocates, but that have to be debated within the administration, within the Congress, and crucially in the public, not just in those five states, but across the US. We are talking about not just $100 billion to build these missiles, but more likely $264 billion, a quarter of a trillion dollars for the entire life cycle cost. And we need to have a debate about whether that is the best use of funds when the US is racking up massive deficits and ignoring other national security priorities. Do you think, um, Tom, that the administration or my being utopian idealistic uh, pays attention to actually the law of the globe, uh, the international law around the NPT, which is about building down and ending, abolishing nuclear war. I'm struck also by what happened at the UN in this last year. In October, the global, the ban on nuclear weapons was passed by 50 countries, I think ratified. But that doesn't enter, does it? And I mean, with all due respect, it doesn't enter in Washington debates or the administration's not, not nuclear posture review. Well, let me give just a little bit of background for the audience here. Uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which went into effect in 1970, was essentially a deal between the five nuclear weapon state of that age and the rest of the world, that if the rest of the world forswore forever the option of building nuclear weapons, that the five states would work assiduously to down, uh, down build and eventually eliminate nuclear weapons. Well, for the next 15 years, the five nuclear states built up their arsenals yeah. and since then have built them down slowly. Significant progress. We have 85% fewer weapons in both the US and the Russian arsenal than in the 1970s. That's good, but the rest of the world did not anticipate that this promise from the five nuclear weapon states would be still far from realization 50 years later. And note that it's not just a promise. When the US Senate gave advice and consent to the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1970, Article 6 of that treaty, the commitment to negotiate towards total elimination became a binding legal obligation of the United States. I think that most administrations, with the exception of the last one, took seriously that obligation. And certainly <clears throat> when I was in the Obama administration, we knew that our credibility in trying to prevent other countries from developing nuclear weapons rested upon us being able to show that we were in fact negotiating, we were building down, and that we had a commitment to the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. So I think that most administrations take it seriously. I'm somewhat encouraged by the fact that we have never had a president before Joe Biden who knew as much about nuclear weapons, who thought about it, worked on the issue for literally his entire career. And I think that the people that he's appointed also recognize that we have this obligation. And that's one of the points I wanted to make about the article, is assuming that we still need 
400 ICBMs in the year 2075, more than 50 years from now, is premature surrender. It says we are abandoning our legal obligation to work towards the elimination of nuclear weapons. And I don't think that's a stance that either provides for American security, and I know that it diminishes American credibility around the world. Well, I would hope you, I, I hope you might brief Congress in this next period because under Obama, as you know better than I do, he traded, I think it was for a new start, he kind of traded it for more modernization. But I wanted to ask Elizabeth, if I could, back to, again, what's so powerful about your article is how deeply reported it is and how you went to, you know, Wyoming, North Dakota, and there was in Shelby, Montana, someone named Zane Zell, Zane Zell yep, who, whose land, they, you know, put a silo on his land and he became part of a, he founded a movement called Group Silence, One Silo. And um, it was just one of the many efforts in the 1980s, which was under the radar, but sort of anti-nuclear movement bloomed. And you know that you wrote about the day after, which prompted so many. There were a million people in Central Park in 1982, I think. Do you see a way today to revive that? I mean, your article in some ways has many purposes, many purposes and can be read by many different people in different ways. But one of them was how do we re re revive does one fuse with a climate energy movement, which has so much energy, or how do you how do you see it moving ahead? Yeah. So right now there is a significant global movement uh, to abolish nuclear weapons, and that's embodied in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which you know just passed its ratification mark. So in some technical sense, is in force now. Um, this movement has been really animated by people in non-nuclear weapons having countries who say, look, this is unjust. Like a nuclear detonation has no borders. We're going to die. We're going to suffer if this happens. It's essentially, it's, it's not fair that you countries with nuclear weapons are putting us at this risk. Um, so that is a pretty energized global movement. Um, and I think they've done good work to um, kind of stigmatize and delegitimize, delegitimize and get a conversation going about nuclear weapons. I don't, I, I think for there to be a really powerful global movement that, that has some impact, that would have to really take root in the countries that have nuclear weapons, uh, especially the United States and Russia, uh, which of course still have by far the biggest arsenals. Um, and um, I don't honestly, I don't currently think that's happening in the United States. Um, I mean, I met with people in, in Montana who were very involved in, um, you know, anti-nuclear efforts in the 80s, uh, you know, when it became a real global movement. Um, I'm not really seeing that right now. Um, and I think also you've got this issue, like it's gonna be different in democracies and non-democracies, right? So there's nine countries that have nuclear weapons. And even if you have a kind of powerful public voice in the US or France or India, um, I don't even know if that can happen in uh, less democratic countries. So, um, I, I, what I see out there is a lot of kind of non-awareness. I mean, people even asking me, like, we still have those things, um, you know, that, that 100 billion in, in, you know, public money is being spent on. So I, I don't see it right now. I, I guess that's a more maybe pessimistic. Oh, no, I think that, I think you're not seeing people in the streets. I do think there's a divestment campaign underway. And in New York City, where I live, the controller, I think, has passed that no pension funds can hold nuclear hmm weapons uh, stock, which leads me to ask you if I could, one of the most powerful parts of your article is a photograph. There's of the head of Northrop Grumman mm -hmm. in a red, you know, not, surrounded by real estate people, mm -hmm. surrounded by bankers, I think, by political givers. Mm -hmm. There's no legislator as far as I understand, but they are groundbreaking for this mm -hmm. silo, for the 
place where they're going to make these weapons. Talk to us a little if it's if you were surprised or if it what what you expected the nexus of revolving door of money of uh, you know what you see uh, which Tom spoke to as well when he talks about active service lobbying. Yeah. I mean, that's that's so interesting to me. And and Tom, as a, a Washington and policy guy, can can also speak to this. But um, you know, every US industry lobbies, um, the defense industry probably, you know, it isn't even the biggest lobbyist, um, but it does lobby significantly. Uh, so that entails um, you know, individuals and PACs who are associated with the company can give money directly to uh, members of Congress and they dole it out everywhere. You know, it's like not, you know, it's kind of evenly split between Democrats and Republicans. It's like 10,000 of this campaign, 10,000 of that campaign. Um, but then you find these um, recipient politicians being very pro uh, nuclear missile. Um, you know, we saw this uh, last summer um, when there was an attempt in Congress um, by Ro Khanna, who's a, who represents yeah. Valley. He kind of spearheaded, he said, hey, let's take $1 billion from this missile and let's put it to pandemic preparedness. Um, he, you know, that didn't get anywhere through. And, and Liz Cheney, who represents Wyoming, kind of gave a little speech saying like, you know, essentially, how dare you? Like that's giving into China, which doesn't even make sense. Um, you know, but but her but uh, the um, you know, there's a nuclear missile base in her in her state right there. So, um, yeah, there there's the, the photo you're talking about that's very dramatic is the the CEO of Northrop Grumman surrounded by some legislators like Mitt Romney's in there because he's a is, is he? I didn't. Yeah, he's one of um, various other Utah legislators because this missile is going to be built in Utah. And so they were breaking ground on the North of Grumman GBSD headquarters that that was like summer of 2019. Um, and now that building is complete. You know, the, the rocket testing range is nearby and they're going full steam ahead. But the photo I thought was interesting because it's got Utah legislators, it's got real estate developers, there's not a military person in sight, you know, it's not even about that in that case. So yeah, lobbying is one of those things that, you know, if you, if you start to get critical, everyone says, well, everybody does it, which is kind of true, but that doesn't necessarily make it um, ethical. I wanted to just close with Tom for a minute and we'll go to questions, but um, talk about this idea that, you know, weapons are foolproof, that we don't face risk. The risks we've averted are chilling. Um, and also, um, you know, the idea that every, um, that William, you know, William Perry talks about some simple things. This is not the NPT, but taking weapons off of trigger alert, no first use, uh, the auth congressional authorization involvement with the uh, suitcase, and I'm just wondering where you feel those issues, which seem to me more salient, are in the arms control community, Tom. Well, the, <clears throat> the ICBMs we possess today defend against one particular threat, which is the possibility that one morning the leader in the Kremlin will wake up and decide this is the day I will launch an all out attack upon the United States with all of my nuclear forces. There is no indication in history that any political leader in either Moscow or Washington has ever contemplated initiating a mass murder, mass suicide pact. It is not something any rational person would do. Uh, now, people might point out that proves the success of the ICBM, that the Russians have never attempted it. But it is not only the ICBM. The fact is that we have the other means capable of a massive retaliation upon any Russian leader who was stupid enough to launch such an attack. So the probability 
of an all out surprise attack is vanishingly low. And there's no reason to expect that will change. But what is a greater probability? That is the likelihood of stumbling into nuclear war based on bad information. Mm -hmm. A computer error, a human error, a satellite error may indicate to leaders in either Moscow or Washington that there is an all out attack underway. This is not far fetched. It has happened several times throughout the Cold War, bringing us within minutes of the president facing a decision. And the particular thing about ICBMs is they must be launched on warning. That is, as soon as you have an indication that the US is under attack. That means the president has less than 10 minutes and more likely less than seven minutes to ask the question, are we sure this is an all out attack? If he doesn't move within seven minutes, then those incoming Russian missiles will wipe out our ICBMs. We are forced to use them or lose them. And in that sense, as Secretary Bill Perry, the defense secretary who knew more about nuclear weapons than anyone in US history uh, in that job, I recommend you read his book. It's called Simply the Button. He says that this is what makes ICBMs the most destabilizing part of our nuclear arsenal and that we would be more secure, less at risk, from accidental war and still able with other means to retaliate against any surprise attack with our other uh, weapons. So investing a quarter of a trillion dollars, thousand dollars for every man, woman and child in the US uh, in a uh, weapon that makes us less secure ought to be questioned. Let me just make one point about uh, what you and Elizabeth were discussing a moment ago, which is uh, the congressional action that some people have been calling for is simply a comprehensive objective review of the alternative, mm -hmm. which is to extend the life of the Minuteman three missile for another couple of decades. Mm -hmm. The military says that's impossible, it won't work, we need to build something new. They may in the end be correct, but the fact that the congressional advocates fight like hell to prevent even a study of the question, I think underlines the weakness of their technical argument. And that's aside from the security and political arguments that we've been making. I don't think it's unreasonable for citizens to ask of the White House and of the Congress, can we get an impartial study about alternatives instead of continuing the rush that the Trump administration and the Congress made to lock in this program in a way that would be hard for any president to reverse. It's a fairly reasonable request and I think I know the reasons it is so strongly resisted by the missile lobby. Thank you, Tom. Who, who once said that an indestructible weapon system is one that is built in every congressional district? That's what we've got. There are hundreds of subcontractors. So, uh, you know, there are political solutions. And I think you only have to look at the fact that the US has closed military bases around the country many times over the last few years. And in almost every case, substituting other federal spending it's and allowing private investment on those facilities have made each of those communities more economically prosperous than when the base was open. Yeah. So I understand the desire of senators to get their share of the federal defense budget to their state and their district. But it's not rational economic policy and it's not rational defense policy. 
So thank, I'm going to turn it over to Halle for a minute to just walk us through how you can raise your hand and participate in questions. Thanks, um, thanks, Katrina. Hello again. As a reminder, my name is Hallie Posner, and I'm the program manager here at the Bulletin. We do ask that you please keep yourself on mute throughout the program unless you are called on for a question, but please keep your cameras on as we are striving to build community and each of you is a member of our community. If you have a question for our speakers or moderator, please use the raised hand function. Our moderator will see that and call on you. Uh, you can find this by clicking on the participants button or the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, uh, depending on your setup. Please do not physically raise your hand. There are too many participants for us to recognize you in that way. Also, please note that we have many folks on the call. So we apologize in advance if we do not get to your question. Um, if you've already raised your hand, rest assured, we see you. But again, as I say, are unlikely to get to all questions. A recording of this program will also be available on our website in the coming days. Uh, back to you, Katrina. So um, I see uh, Cora and Peter Weiss. Would you unmute? Not that you've ever been muted. <laughs> do I? No, all right. Do I, do I need to? I've sent Cora an unmute prompt. Okay. Or you have to accept the prompt and then you'll be able to speak. Cora does, yeah. Cora, if, are you there? All right. I will try Bob Swan and come back to Cora. Bob Swan? Yes, very interesting discussion. Uh, I think that the, the the button makes the key point, uh, the ninth objective they talked about in the last chapter, nuclear Titanic, that we've got to really build, uh, get the bomb into the mass movement. And we have recently organized the uh, International Peace Center in Lawrence, which of course was where the day after was filmed. Oh, we have yeah. a lot of people who are very concerned about nuclear war, 120 years before the film was, formed, was filmed, uh, Lawrence was destroyed in the greatest atrocity of the Civil War, Quantrill's movement. So we have this history here and we're gonna do everything we can to try to tie in and educate people at the citizen citizen level. Uh, we are working with the mayor's offices uh, of Japan, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we're gonna be working up some cooperative programs. Our treasurer is Hiroko Komiya, Japanese American woman. So we're, we're doing this because I think from a red state, this could create some interest. We're right here in the middle of about as republic and a state as you can imagine. And so we're, we're really excited. We're getting a lot of early support from officials. The city commission is, uh, we've done a proclamation on the 75th atomic bombing. So I just wanted to uh, just let everyone know that we're gonna be really working on this in the heart of the country to try to help with this problem. We've got to educate people about all the reasons why building more is more dangerous than negotiating changes with, I think Russia would even be open to right now. And that's what we have to do. The book points out that our greatest threat really are the ground-based missiles because of the threat of a mistake versus the threat of some crazy one uh, launching. I mean, we don't have to worry about that as much anymore in this country. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. There is a documentary uh, coming out, I hope in the next months about the making of the day after set in uh, Lawrence. So it might be interesting to show it uh, as you do your work. Um, Cora Weiss, back to you, unmute, no? Okay, Peter Metz. Might you unmute and ask him? Hi, um, I'm Peter Metz uh, in the Boston area. Um, I want to particularly ask uh, Tom Countryman, with all of his diplomatic experience, what, what about the idea of the Biden administration, which you identify as knowing more about nuclear disarmament than any previous administration, and Joe Biden in particular, initiating a very, very bold idea, get all nine nuclear nations to simultaneously disarm towards zero? It strikes me as a bold idea that has a chance of galvanizing the kind of public support that we had back in the 80s when everybody feared so much because it's so desirable. Um, <clears throat> what do you think? Well, of course, I would love it. Uh, I think the president has a lot on his plate and has to pick his battles fairly carefully 
in view of the fact that the priority things he has to work on are all going to be resisted in at least one house of the Congress. Um, I would advocate for a uh, less dramatic but equally meaningful path. And that is one that is laid out by four great cold warriors. Uh, George Schultz, who just passed away last month at the age of 100, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, Sam Nunn, and Bill Perry have advocated some initiative in which the leaders of the nuclear powered states commit not to immediate disarmament, but commit to taking steps that stop the arms race and create the conditions for building down and getting towards zero. And uh, I'll just, I just happen to have this book right here. It's called The War That Must Never Be Fought. You can find a full explication of their ideas there. I think it, that's more realistic. And by the way, that's not an initiative that has to be taken by Joe Biden. Why can't the leader of the United Kingdom or India or China uh, project some global leadership by making this suggestion? It's not just pie in the sky. If it were uh, anything that comes from Kissinger, Schultz, Perry, Nunn, uh, you have to know they've thought hard about the realism of such an idea. Tom, thank you. I, I just want to remark that uh, the most radical committed abolitionist to head a major country turns 90 next week, Mikhail Gorbachev, um, who in Reykjavik in 1986, uh, you know, approached the idea of abolition. And I, he and Reagan, when, uh, I don't know if they ended the Cold War, I still think we're in one, but they both said, a nuclear war can never be fought, can never be won, must never be fought. And I think those are important words to remember. So, Cor, I'm giving you one more chance. And, and can I just say, Katrina wrote a very excellent piece about Gorbachev and idealism that was published in yesterday's Washington Post. Hallie, maybe you could put the link up in the chat. I want to recommend for all of you who want to go deeper on this topic, there have been just exceptional detailed pieces written in the last couple months. And I think Hallie is putting these up in the chat. Uh, most recently from the Federation of American Scientists, from the publication War on the Rocks, Mm -hmm. uh, Frank von Hippel also published in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. You can see Bill Perry's editorial in the Washington Post from last November. Just this week, both The Economist and Bloomberg have written articles about this very topic. There's a reason we're doing this today. Yes. This is an issue the President and the Congress have to deal with this year, and it is one that offers the best possibility of turning this giant ship in a slightly different direction away from nuclear escalation. Uh, so this is the time to be involved on exactly this topic. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Cora, Rob from Canada. Thank you very much. Um, a fascinating discussion. Um, uh, Elizabeth, um, one of the things, of course, that I got the most out of your article is, of course, just the, in, in the modernization of all nine forces, it's only the Americans that are still looking at the ICBMs rather than the maritime-based uh, modernization that all eight are all doing. I found that fascinating. My question, though, for both you and Thomas, though, is there not a more dangerous and insidious problem that's developing rather than just focusing on the, uh, the land-based missile that we seem to be entering into a system where we're moving away from a, um, a, a focus and acceptance of nuclear deterrence, as bad as that is, into one that is now re-examining and refocusing on nuclear war fighting. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that if you look at the Russian policy and procurements, the escalate to de-escalate, the, the MiGs with the Kazals, the hypersonics, and then you look at the American policy in, in 2018, 
the modernization of the nuclear posture. You look at the deployment of the tacticals on the uh, Ohio class and other modernization steps that we seem to be entering into a system that is becoming even more dangerous because if we are in fact going for this nuclear war fighting, in other words, not just simply deterring, but the actual utilization of them in a scenario that both we see in the American and the Russian policies, is that something that's sort of fundamentally different now and something that may in fact even be more dangerous than, than, than the materials that you're raising in your, in your conversation of your article? Yeah, I mean, I don't know, is it more or less, but it's certainly an issue, um, this idea of tactical nuclear weapons, also sometimes known as small nuclear weapons. Um, you know, they, they have a, a, technically a smaller impact um, but the fear in the non-proliferation community is, well, if you are thinking of your nuclear weapons as just small little things to fight little nuclear wars, it actually increases the chances that they're going to get used. So I, you know, I think um, Pakistan and India already have these small, or they're also sometimes called battlefield nuclear weapons, um, you know, and have actually conducted exercises where members of the military are, are kind of, you know, trying to suit themselves up against nuclear fallout. Um, so I do think that the idea of a small nuclear weapon, which the US and Russia are pursuing, um, is a very dangerous one with its own risks. Um, Tom can probably go even deeper on that uh, than I can. <laughs> I'll try not to go too deep. Yeah. Uh, low yield nuclear weapons, that is my second favorite euphemism, uh, right behind alternative facts. Uh. Um, the, uh, uh, I, we are at risk of going back to the future, if you like, of going back to the Cold War, where the US had literally thousands of nuclear weapons of different yields deployed in Europe. Uh, we had a nuclear weapon for every occasion from all out war down to a picnic. And gradually, American thinkers and generals, and then Soviet thinkers and generals realized how profoundly destabilizing it was to have so many kinds of weapons and to have them so forward deployed. And we pulled back from that. And that was great progress. Uh, we're edging back towards that uh, today uh, for the reasons that you mentioned, Rob. Uh, suspicion about why the other side still feels it necessary to have battlefield appropriate, that is lower yield nuclear weapons, that suspicion on each side drives the other to think harder about the circumstances in which those weapons could be used, thinking harder about it and having those weapons available makes it more likely that they will be used, not to end a conflict, but to escalate a conflict. Uh, I still don't think this is quite as high a risk as the all out nuclear exchange that could be caused by computer or human or satellite error given ICBM's launch on warning posture. Uh, but it is a growing threat that uh, we need to deal with in some very serious talks with Moscow. It's interesting, um, you haven't, no one's mentioned China. I think someone might have, but that's another part of this as Trump didn't want to reopen, remember this new start unless China was involved. But I want to Just go- one, one fascinating point about China, yeah. which is ICBMs as things stand today are of no use against China. Interesting. If we fire ICBMs at China or North Korea for whatever reason, the Russians will be unable to tell until close to impact, whether those are coming for Russia or going to China or North Korea. Mm -hmm. So they would instantly attack the United States on the assumption we were attacking Russia. That's why military plans, uh, when they think about contingencies for 
defending Japan or South Korea against China or North Korea, the plan is to use submarine-based missiles and not ICBMs. Thank you for that sobering thought. Uh, Joel Marie Lewis. Okay. Hi, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Joe Lewis. Yeah, this is a question for uh, Mr. Countryman. On the idea of the US's uh, possible policy on no first use or sole purpose use, do you have any idea, I was wondering about Secretary Blinken's own personal opinions on that, uh, if, they would, if he would like to see the US going in that direction and um, also on Mallory Stewart's um, position, if you've heard it in the past or you've spoken to either of them, if you think they might have a drive to, to get us there. And then also, um, if you do think that there is a, a desire for it in the new administration, what, do you, what is your suggestion as to the best way to go about that? Does the United States come out with uh, a new policy for no first use or sole purpose, or do we um, do it in at the same time as the Russians like meet with them together and then um, and announce it at the same time or something. Thank you. First, I, I don't know Secretary Blinken's point of view on this. You mentioned Mallory Stewart, who is now uh, just this month, the new senior official for arms control issues at the National Security Council at the White House. Uh, she is an outstanding lawyer, one of the best lawyers in this field that you can think of. Uh, I can't think that I've ever discussed no first use with her. Uh, what I hope for is that the president will give some guidance. You'll recall in the final week of the Obama administration in January 2017, Joe Biden made a speech in which he said, it was his belief that the U.S. needs to move towards a nuclear doctrine of no first use or a slightly different definition, sole purpose. Uh, I still think that is an important step for the United States to take. It doesn't immediately solve all of our problems, but it creates the possibility for a more secure United States at a lower level of armament achieved through negotiations with Russia and with others. And I would hope, <clears throat> as I said, the president has about 193 other things on his plate, yeah. but I would hope he would find time to make that statement and give that guidance rather than postponing it for a year while the bureaucracy works on the usual nuclear posture review. But, uh, that's just my hope. Thank you. Katrina, I can back if you can hear me. All right. So Cora Weiss, we tried you six times. This is <laughs> I, I think knowing Cora, this is the last question. Okay. <laughs> oh no, that's not fair. But first of all, I think everyone's been spectacular and it's been very important to be informed about this greatest single existential threat together with climate change. But I can't believe that 249 people are gonna leave this call without an action, without something we can all do together. And we've got to, That's we can't wait for some organization to call us. Cora, tell us. Well, I think that a hundred billion dollars could probably cure the pandemic overnight. And I think we ought to start making a list of what a hundred billion can buy and start using that money. If it's available for the modernization or increase in weaponry and nuclear weaponry, it can be transferred to human security. Cora, could I just read Elizabeth? And I'm sure you've read the article, but she does say in fourth paragraph, to put that price tag in perspective, 100 billion could pay 2.84, 3.3 million hospital stays for COVID-19 patients and 1 million elementary school teacher salaries. And I fully agree with you. That but to how many vaccinations can it pay for? All of them. Probably everybody <laughs> in the whole world. And that's what we should be doing together. That's it's human security. I agree. And I agree. Thank you, Katrina. You've been great. Mr. Countryman, you're brilliant. Everybody knows everybody's smart.
Now you got to read Elizabeth's article. It's truly, uh, it's, I wish we'd run it in the nation. All right. <laughs> All right. So it is now 154 and I want to turn back to the two important speakers just for some concluding remarks uh, to this session. And thank you for this, I will say sobering, bracing, informative, um, important conversation as um, Cora said. So maybe Elizabeth and then. Sure, uh, I'll touch on something you mentioned Katrina, which is nobody had really brought up China. Um, the interesting thing about China is it was, it was brought up a lot, particularly during the last administration as justification for spending a lot on modernization and spending a lot on land-based missiles, um, which actually doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, the Pentagon uh, estimates that China may double its nuclear arsenal. If it does that, it'll have about 600 nuclear warheads. Um, the United States and Russia still have close to 4,000 each. So it's not even coming close. And what I think is interesting is that China, which you know, I think a lot of security analysts would consider the bigger, longer, long-term you know, US yeah. security threat than Russia, um, it's not focusing on these weapons. It's putting its budget toward weapons of the future like cyber. And you know, just as the US sort of in a way spent the Soviet Union into oblivion during the arms race, while China, in a sense, is doing that now, we're the ones spending money on kind of archaic land-based nuclear missiles while it is looking to the future. So I will leave it at that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And Tom? Um, yeah, a uh, couple of points. Uh, one is, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have it at my fingertips, but the Arms Control Association uh, produced last year an uh, outstanding piece called Nuclear Excess, and it analyzes the $1.7 trillion that the U.S. intends to spend in the next 30 years on modernizing nuclear weapons and delivery systems, and it has a number of great examples of what else you could buy with that money whether it is other necessary defense spending that does more for the security challenges of the future than some of the nuclear weapons, whether it is public health, which to me should be regarded as a national security issue, or whether it's investment in productive jobs, mm -hmm. uh, because defense spending is the least efficient type of government spending when it comes to creation of jobs. Uh, so there's a lot of good ideas. I urge you to go to the armscontrol.org website. Uh, so here's my last thought is, um, are we doomed to incremental thinking away from the status quo? Are we required, because we have used ICBMs for 60 years, despite the constantly changing rationale of why we use ICBMs, are we doomed to use them for the next 60 years as well? Instead of starting from where we are, and making budget and policy decisions and negotiations with the Russians, in just an incremental step-by-step -step way, are we capable of defining a nuclear posture, of defining a policy, of creating a defense budget that actually contains some vision? And this is where I like coming back to Katrina's point. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev is not a popular man in Russia these days, but was the most visionary leader that a nuclear powered state has ever seen. So can we get to that, a, uh, a concept of security that excludes ICBMs, that promotes America's national security, but that greatly reduces the risk that we will accidentally extinguish human life on the planet? 
I think it's possible. I think it's up to the president. I think the president and the Congress need to hear from a few million Americans on the topic. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. I just want to come back very briefly to saying, if we can't begin to redefine or reimagine what security means in these times, when will we? And as Biden has shown in crisis, boldness is demanded. So I think it's something on his mind and need to extend it to this arena. I want to thank Elizabeth and Tom for a really bracing, sobering, interesting, important conversation, uh, especially so in these times, but all times. And to repeat what Cora said, let's all go into our communities, wherever we are, in Montana, Washington, DC, and uh, commit to at least, you know, telling a few people, taking some action, finding out about what's going on with divestment. But I also want to close by thanking the bulletin. Um, my uh, late husband, Stephen Cohen, was, is very close to Alex Rabinowitz, whose father, right, Rachel, founded the bulletin. So uh, it's very, the, in, the bulletin at 75, that is an important institution that has survived. The nation's 155, but put that aside. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn it back to Hallie to give us our instructions. Thanks so much, Katrina. Thank you to Elizabeth and to Tom for this conversation and to you, Katrina, for stewarding us through it. Stay tuned for our March 17 virtual program with Pulitzer Prize winning author, Elizabeth Colbert. We will discuss her new book, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. And last but not least, thank you to all of you, members of the Bulletin's community for joining us and participating this last hour. Ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.